so this was a podcast that Red Flag Radio did, um, which is a really great publication out of Australia. Um, some good Trotskyist comrades of ours do really consistent, great stuff. It's like the only podcast that I ever find myself recommending. Um, really consistent Marxist analysis. Um, so yeah, this is a, a episode that they did. Um, it's a book um, under the same name by someone named Vishti Fox um, that I read not too long ago. A uh, really great book. Um, I think it serves as a great like kind of a primer um, on like the relevant aspects of, of Palestine um, and, and skips over some of the kind of like galaxy brain shit of like, what about 3000 years ago when this one random dude came over here? Like it really gets to like the heart of the matter um, and really takes a historical materialist perspective um, on how these class dynamics came about. Um, so yeah, a brief history of Palestine, Palestinian resistance, um, a people unbowed and unbroken. Ooh. There we go. Um, <clears throat> okay, so prior to Jewish immigration, um, a slogan that gets passed around a lot is that it was that Palestine was a land without a people for a people without a land, um, that being the, the Jewish people. Um, this was a, an area of the Ottoman Empire um, right around like the Suez Canal um, and the Ottoman Empire collapsed, um, was defeated by fucking somebody or I don't even know. Um, and then there was the sykes uh, picot Agreement um, which created divisions. Um, the imperialist powers created divisions within the Middle East, basically kind of divvying up um, the third world um, between like which colonial power would kind of rule which. Um, and the British government ended up taking the land, um, the Palestinian land, the, the land of Palestine. Um, and then, uh, you know, France had some areas and stuff like that in Belgium and, you know, all the other, all the other schmucks. Um, so this was in, uh, yeah, 1916. Um, and then the Balfour Declaration is in 1920. Um, and that basically sets up uh, Zionism. Um, or, or uh, kind of gifts the area of Palestine to uh, the Jewish people as, as the Zionist state. Um, it was described as uh, the Jewish state under the protection of the British crown, which might compromise three or four million Jews, would from every point of view be beneficial and would be especially in harmony with the truest interests of the British empire. Um, and this is kind of like Zionism or, or yeah, and that's kind of like where Zionism finds its home. Um, uh, starting with the quote at the bottom, the uh, Zionism, the book defines Zionism as the coming together of the requirements of British imperialism to dominate an oil rich part of the world with a movement that could serve its interests, Zionism. Um, so I think this quote really, like, really sums up really well kind of like where this ideology of Zionism comes from. Um, this isn't some like natural inborn trait. Um, this isn't something like instinctual anything. Rather, there's a very specific set of material circumstances um, that lend itself to an ideology that serve um, those material interests. Um, and here we have British imperialism, um, specifically petrol imperialism. Um, so yeah, it's serving British imperialism. Um, it's an oil rich land. Um, it predates the horrors of the Nazi concentration camps. I added this in there just to kind of make the point that a lot of Zionists will try to um, assert that Zionism was a necessity post um, Holocaust, um, which, is to, which is not to say that, that the Holocaust wasn't horrendous um, and we shouldn't speak to that um, and, and champion that, um, but that Zionism as an ideology existed long before uh, concentration camps, uh, the Nazi concentration camps, long before the Holocaust. Um, it was specifically a movement that came about in the 1880s um, that was kind of pushed forward by Jewish elites um, who began to identify as Zionist elites. And the working class and poor Jewish communities could kind of like care less about Zionism at its inception. Um, they were much more concerned with uh, what was called the Bund, which was uh, like Jewish uh, socialism, Jewish communism. Um, and that was kind of like the big contention between Zionism 
um, and and or the big ideological contention um, with Zionism was the um, was uh, the Bund, um, which is an organization of of uh, Jewish socialism. Um, and then in 1890, the Zionist immigration begins. Um, people kind of like start to trickle down there. Uh, Jewish communities start to trickle down there. Um, and then there's a mass immigration in, well, mass immigration of 85,000 people between 1990 and um, 1923. Um, there's just a couple of, of Zionist ideas um, that the book kind of speaks to, or, or rather that I speak to, um, that Zionism has always existed. Um, much like other nationalisms, Zionism developed a lengthy historical imagination. I really love that quote um, to like understand these because we do the same thing with like white nationalism, which is the same thing with like with any kind of like uh, you know uh, Eurocentricism or or um, you know really anything else um, is that it creates this like this uh, understanding of itself as existing from time in memoriam. Um, and as Marxists, we wanna go back and wanna study where that ideolo ideology comes from specifically, what are the material circumstances that give birth to um, this abstraction, um, right? So with white supremacy, we can see shadow slavery and stuff like that, um, where Zionism comes from, um, uh, something else. Uh, uh, and, and the other one is that Zionism is, is an instinct. Um, it was not a natural reflection of an internal Jewish desire for a homeland. Um, in the same time that approximately 160,000 people um, or Jewish immigrants went to Palestine, um, approximately 3 million of them went to the U.S. Um, and half a million went to Western Europe. This is all from, from Eastern Europe. Um, so they emigrated from Eastern Europe um, and primarily went to the U.S. Um, so if they were going to kind of like claim a Jewish homeland, it would technically be in the U.S. because that's where a vast majority um, of people immigrated to. So this, all of this, um, all this immigration, um, all this immigration around here um, kind of like boils over into the 1920s. And then the first kind of like big uprising is the riots of, there's a riot in 1920. Um, and there's uh, five, uh, five Jews that die and then four Palestinians that die. Um, and it's kind of after this uh, revolt of the Palestinians um, that British recognizes the need to kind of balance its heavy hand and concede more to the Arab states um, and, the, and the Palestinians. Uh, because it's very obvious after after this that the, the colonial rule is not welcome in the area that people are that the, the the indigenous population isn't just going to kind of roll over um, and allow the British Empire to steamroll over it um, that they're going to be actively fighting back um, they're going to be actively arming themselves um, rioting rebelling you know all that kind of stuff um, and because of this um, concession Israel begins to get much more skeptical of the promises that the British Empire has given it to create its own homeland. Um, so there's kind of like a, a Israel becomes less buddy buddy with the British Empire following this. Um, and this kind of like continues to culminate. Um, there's like increased immigration, increased displacement of Palestinians, and this culminates in the Arab Revolt of 1936. Um, which was a revolt against British occupation um, and Zionist immigration um, that was only squelled after um, just uh, the sheer terror of the British empire. Between 38 and 39, at least one Arab was sentenced to death every week. Um, these weren't just like, um, you know, gas chamber kind of executions. These were like large spectacles of like beheadings and hangings, um, big kind of like fantastic events. Um, where they would murder people in front of as many people as they could. Um, the sheer brutality of the British crackdown on this, um, it was of note. Um, the tensions that led to this Arab revolt um, were fueled by the dispossession of land and the social and political exclusion um, of the Palestinian people, and then also just the sheer uh, violent repression, um, which I think, you know, we can see like similarities between those tensions and so many other places in the world um, and so many other kind of like uh, class dynamics of an incumbent um, bourgeois class that's trying to push a, 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 a um, 
an indigenous class uh, or an indigenous group of people off its land and giving them no say in any kind of like the politics or the, uh, you know, the social runnings of things. Um, at the height of, its, of this uh, revolt, there was 5,000 armed Palestinian militants. Um, but they are defeated, they are put down. Um, and this creates a really big imbalance in power between this, the growing Zionist movement and the, Palest and the, um, the indigenous Palestinians um, that are um, living there and have been living there for hundreds of years. Um, one of the big, one of the big uh, features of the imbalance in power is the Jewish National Fund, um, which is kind of like a financial institution for buying up land. Um, so like collective Jewish capital or, or collectivizing Jewish capital and like a centralized financial institution that could then go out and buy um, land and then kind of like sell it back to um, Jewish immigrants at lower rates. And we can see like really similar functions within like a neoliberal economic policy um, in like the 80s and 90s. Um, but this is kind of like way before that, but similar stuff. Um, and then also the, the paramilitary, the Israeli paramilitary forces begin to like really take, really come to rise after this air revolt. Um, the Irgun, the uh, Haganah and the Stern gang um, would all be considered terrorists in today's terminology and in today's conceptions. Um, and they are, you know, are terrorists for all, you know, for all, for all purposes. Um, and this kind of like rolls over these like increased military repression rolls over into or increased military activity of the Israeli group because they're not technically a state yet um, rolls over into the Nakba, which is in 1948. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, um, the Nakba is known as the catastrophe. Um, it's the end of the Balfour Declaration, which is, you know, uh, it's the end of, of British colonial rule. And at midnight on that night, um, Israel declares itself a state and declares itself the state that is, you know, that is, uh, holds dominion over the Palestinians land. Um, it's immediately, it's uh, immediately recognized by the, sorry, someone's texting me. Blech. Go away. Um, immediately recognized by the USSR um, and the USA, like Stalin kind of like immediately recognizes the state of Israel. Um, 750,000 to 900,000 Palestinians in 1948 alone are ethnically cleansed from their land. Um, there's a lot to go into here. Um, the stories are really, really horrific. Um, if you haven't yet, or you haven't, you know, dug into this history or whatever, I don't really want to go into it, but it, it's a, there's a whole big, there's a whole lot to it. Um, so there's that, uh, one point that somebody, while I was like researching this and stuff, one point that somebody brought up was that this is still an event that's in living memory. Um, the people that were alive in 1948, like, aren't that old. <laughs> that's not that long ago. <laughs> um, and so I think that's really important when understanding like the historical perspective of the Nakba, that it's not this like event that happened forever ago, rather it's like um, kind of like our parents and grandparents would have very like conceivably been alive for this and would have like experienced that firsthand, um, the, or the Palestinians would have experienced that firsthand. Um, so yeah. And then I had a couple of pictures. Um, it creates this like massive Palestinian diaspora um, in neighboring um, Arab countries, um, people are just kind of like forced to like pick up all their stuff and walk, you know, a whole long ways. Um, and then this is kind of like the, the, the map that I'm sure a lot of us have seen before, um, but the kind of like progression of Palestinian lands as it's... Um, expropriated by the Israeli state. Um, so over here on the left, we have like historic Palestine. Um, and then 47 is after the Nakba. Um, and this, then the white represents the Israeli state. Um, the green represents the Palestinian state. And then 67, that shrinks even more. And then it continues to shrink um, and continues to get smaller and smaller. Um, and you can see like Gaza over there on the left-hand side um, 
and then yeah, the West Bank over here on the right, um, which being kind of continually fractured and broken up. Um, and then yeah, that the Zionist oppression um, of the Israeli state kind of takes into today. Um, there are officially 665 laws that explicitly discriminate against the Palestinians living in Israel. Um, pretty like blatant kind of apartheid regime going on. Um, more than half of these laws were introduced since 2000. There's been a large resurgence of like right wing Israeli politics in the last like 20 years or so. Um, and then just the continual expansion of Israel into lands that were um, that are technically Palestinian, um, but they don't honor any of that and just kind of like do whatever they want to do. Um, Haza is known as the world's largest open air prison. There's over 2 million people that live there. 97% um, of the drinking water is contaminated. Um, so it's like poisoned. Uh, it's a majority minority city. So most of the people living in Haza are under the age of 18 because um, they've literally killed everyone who's um, who's they've killed so many of the adults um, that it's a majority of people that are under the age of 18, um, which I always like point out because when you're talking about Haza, it's like technically speaking, they're like minors that all these like crazy things are happening to when like Israel bombs got, you know, Haza, it's like te they're technically like bombing minors, um, which I think is important. Um, their movement's heavily restricted and, uh, and yeah, then I just put a note in there of like the, the Haza massacre of 2008, um, which Israel called Operation Cast Lead, sorry. Um, and among a bunch of other things, there was a uh, 350 children um, were killed in three weeks. Um, just kind of like blanket uh, bombings of uh, city blocks and stuff like that. Um, Alice Walker refers to this as an insult to the human soul. Um, I had a slide in here about kind of self-defense or is Israel's claims to self-defense. Uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, is one of the most well-funded, well-equipped, technologically advanced military in the whole world. Um, and this is up against um, Gaza that has access to like four hours of electricity a day and lacks basic medical supplies. Um, it's kind of like laughable to call this a conflict or to call this like fighting. Um, it's just like kind of a, a, a massacre. Um, so yeah, I think I had, yeah. So this is a photo of like rockets. This is like Haas over here on the left. And you can see how everything's like real scattered around. Um, they're probably more like actually described as fireworks than they are missiles. And then over here on the right hand side, you have the IDF's like probably laser guided um, missiles that are like really pinpoint accuracy um, and all that kind of stuff. So I put that in there. Um, yeah, and then uh, I wanna like switch gears, talk about like Palestinian resistance or Palestinian kind of like um, organizations. Um, there's the Palestinian Communist Party um, that came about back in the 50s. Um, and it was kind of, no, 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 that's not true. Back in like, yeah, like the 20s and 30s. Um, it was initially dominated by left, um, left Jewish people, left Jews, um, who were like sympathetic to, a you know, proletarian struggle. Um, but the party itself was all immigrants, um, from Europe. Um, and they were incredibly isolated from, um, indigenous Arabs that were living in Palestine at the time. Um, the common turn, uh, intervened and said, Hey, um, y'all have no connection to the indigenous population, um, and to the workers that live there. Um, y'all got to fix that. You gotta do something about that. Um, and so the, the Palestinian communist party, uh, changed their tactics and, uh, conducted this, uh, the, the Zionist conquest of work, um, trying to like, uh, kind of diversify their ranks. Um, and become more embedded in the indigenous uh, Arab population um, that they were now living. Um, and then, of course, we have the um, after Stalin comes to power and, uh, you know, the whole degeneration of the worker state, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there's the Stalinization 
of uh, the Palestinian Communist Party. I was going to use a picture, but fuck Stalin. He doesn't have a picture. Um, similar to all of the USSR um, and similar to all the common turn, um, the Stalinization um, uh, ends up being... I didn't put it in here. Uh, it ends up being like they turn the common turn um, from uh, a, an agency for international solidarity into an agency to just uh, kind of like see to it that the Russian ruling class was able to impose its will internationally. Um, so yeah, in situation of national oppression, at worst, it meant opposing self-determination altogether. Um, like in the instance of the Palestinians. And at best, it meant uncritically embracing bourgeois nationalism and downgrading the importance of independent working class organization, um, which is, gonna, is kind of a problem that um, plagues uh, the Palestinian resistance movement um, up into like now. Um, the abandonment of internationalism in favor of nationalism. Um, we see the same mistakes that are made today, um, not adopting a class analysis and understanding that it's the proletariat forces the bourgeois class, um, but being kind of mystified and misguided and thinking that, um, that the struggle between nation states or between nationalities is a more important and a more primary struggle. Um, then there's like the Arab nationalism movement um, which largely kind of like comes about or, or like uh, ties into Palestine um, with the Palestinian uh, diaspora um, that is spread out throughout the Arab world um, after the Nakba. Um, it's like almost a million people that are, um, you know, sent to Lebanon and Syria and um, Iraq and Iran and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, these people that are sent out there are, are they call them, you know, Fatihin. They're like born fighters. You know, th these aren't, Palestine's been experiencing so much turmoil and oppression at that point um, that many of these people that are sent, that are expelled from their homes and sent abroad um, have been resisting imperialist and Zionist rule um, for most of their lives. Um, and so this is kind of like part of that. Um, I think it's like, like an extension of that. I think it's like, like why um, the Arab nationalists, like why um, these people, this diaspora that are spread out um, remain so active and remain so dedicated to returning to their homeland. Um, some of those are the Muslim Brotherhood, the Syrian Social Nationalist Party, um, the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party, or the Arab Nationalist Movement. Um, but all of these lack a certain class analysis. Um, they understand Arab nationalism to be a cross-class collaborationist um, project, um, and they don't... Um, pursue a, pal a working class, a poor and working class um, independent movement um, of a movement independent of um, the Arab capitalists um, and the Arab middle classes. Um, yeah, cross-class Arab nationalism continues to undermine um, an independent revolutionary Palestinian movement. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, the, this is the Fatah and the PLO. Um, the PLO is kind of the most well-known Palestinian um, kind of like organization, Palestinian resistance organization. The, the leadership coming from the Palestinian middle and capitalist classes. Um, this is uh, uh, Arafat, um, who's like a big like oil, he, own, he owns like a bunch of like oil companies or like, or like engineering companies or something like that. Um, He's kind of the big, the big leader. Um, the Fatah is able to like gain power through revolutionary rhetoric, um, through certain arguments and, and publications. They kind of faint towards um, liberatory politics, um, but are kind of empty um, in their follow through. Um, and this is this is due to their class, the class composition of the leadership of these parties um, that the parties themselves come from um, a. a petty bourgeois and a capitalist um, composition um, and which kind of inherently limits the scope of their projects. Um, it's very dominated by the bourgeois. They, uh, they fear the mashes. Uh, they, they, they perpetually capitulate to Western Arab capital um, and fear the masses and the uprising of the masses, not just because of what 
um, it could do to harm their material interests, but also the ways that it could throw them out of power. Um, so they're constantly kind of vying between those two things. Um, and then we have the first Intifada, um, which is in starts in 87 um, and ends in 93 with the Oslo Accords. Um, this is when four Palestinians are killed at a checkpoint. Um, and this prompts a large wave of strikes and demonstrations, um, followed by a massive and violent crackdown um, by Israeli forces. Um, at its peak, there's over 175,000 IDF soldiers that are deployed trying to squell this like massive um, uh, rebellion. Um, this is when the kafia and the stone become big symbols of Palestinian resistance. Um, the kafia is the, the big, like the white and black um, handkerchief um, that they wrap around their heads. And then they throw rocks. <laughs> That's kind of like their um, means of resistance. Um, rocks were met with live rounds and uh, hundreds, like many hundreds, if not thousands of people that are under the age of 17 are murdered by the IDF. Um, once again, we have this like unequal um, balance of force, um, balance of violence. Um, but this movement uh, really checks or really comes back to reclaiming um, old tactics. Um, and the moments before this, the, the Fatah um, and the PLO had kind of uh, denigrated the Palestinian liberation movement to be something that was more uh, defang, something that was more kind of um, centered around negotiations and concessions, um, kind of playing belly up. Um, and this, uh, the first intifada brings the Palestinian liberation movement um, back to these tactics of refusal to pay taxes, um, the closure of shops, um, boycotting of Israeli pro products, and mass street demonstrations. The kind of things that we would call the bread and butter of class warfare. Um, they kind of come back to, to the, the roots of a, a, a Marxist um, informed uh, strategy. Uh, and I just got a couple of pictures in here. Um, this is kind of like the big popular one of these like 13 year old kids that are throwing tanks at a, or throwing rocks like a massive IDF tank, um, which I feel like shows pretty well, like kind of the ridiculousness of it. Um, this is the kafia that I mentioned um, and they're burning something there. Um, a picture kind of showing like the mass demonstration, you see all the people in the background, the, the mass demonstration in the streets. Um, and then we have the second intifada, um, which starts in 2000. Ariel Sharon, who's the defense minister or something like that, um, walks into the al Aska Mosque in Eastern Jerusalem um, with like a thousand armed guards. Um, and the Muslims, the Palestinians do not like that at all, um, which I feel like just shows kind of like what a powder keg um, the whole like social situation is at that moment. Like tensions are very high. Um, and this sets off a whole other round um, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, rebellion. Um, they're mostly rebelling against the horrific conditions that are imposed not just by Israel, um, but also by uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, the people that have kind of been put in charge of Gaza. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they, uh, it, it's not, yeah, so, so now I think like, that the movement itself has matured past like only seeing um, the Israel state as its enemy, enemy, but also identifying the bourgeois leadership of the Palestinian Authority as its enemy as well. Um, and they're, yeah, so they're, this is after years of just being bitter about Palestinian leadership. Um, and this is the time whenever more militant leadership comes to power. And um, when Hamas is like uh, is democratically elected to power, which is a um, is based out of the Muslim Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and this is like primarily a group of Muslim or of bourgeois Muslims, um, and this uh, this really shows like a failure of the Oslo Accords and the obvious uh, corruption of Fatah um, that the people are just kind of like fed up with. Um, and really bitter about. Um, and then, yeah, just the Palestinians' right to self-defense is kind of expressed through the leadership of Hamas. Uh, that's a picture I had. 
of this Palestinian dude. That's kind of like the, the, the glam shot. Um, yeah, then I have a slide on Hamas. Uh, like Fatah, Hamas believes in the necessity of an alliance between all classes in Palestinian society. Well, in practice, this means that the interests of the Palestinian refugees and workers must be subordinated to those of the Palestinian capitalists. Because of this, Hamas does not hold a principled democratic hostility towards the ruling class of the Arab regimes, regimes which are well practiced in the oppression and exploitation of their own working people. Indeed, Hamas seeks the approval and funding of some of the most right-wing Islamic monarchies in the region, such as Iran. Um, so yeah, just to state that um, while Hamas was elected democratically, um, they still uh, pose a serious impediment to a Palestinian liberation movement um, moving forward. And these are just a couple of notes on the struggles that continues today. Um, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, um, which has been alive for a while now, um, primarily a, a, a campus movement. Um, and we've seen developments in that most recently uh, with Jamal Bowman, who is a, an elected uh, Democratic senator, who's a member of the DSA, who kind of now famously voted to fund um, the Iron Dome and then received a lot of backlash for that. Um, and the DSA, instead of siding with the Palestinians within the DSA, um, rather decided to um, expel the BDS working group, um, kind of the Palestinian caucus within the DSA. Um, and uh, I can't remember the exact word, but they like, I like canceled their website and just kind of like nixed them. Um, so that's part of it. And then there's also a large, um, there's a lot of uh, journalistic suppression going on right now um, that's trying to legally equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Um, Palestinian, pro-Palestinian journalists are getting fired and sued for defamation for basically just kind of like speaking the facts of what Israel's doing, um, whether that be, you know, killing someone or bombing a neighborhood and basically saying that those statements are, are anti-Semitic. Um, so those are some of those things. Uh, this is a picture from last year, um, which is like a big bomb that went off. Um, and it's, uh, it's when Israel uh, breaks this, broke a ceasefire on May 26th of last year. Um, the, they bombed Gaza twice in three days. Um, and just kind of shows that like that the oppression and the suppression of um, Palestinian continues uh, today. Um, and then I just ended with this quote from the Algerian president that I found back in the 70s that said, we are with Palestinians, whether they are the oppressed or God willing, the oppressor, um, which I really liked a lot. Um, and I thought really encapsulated this idea of in our thousands and our millions, we are all Palestinians. Um, this idea that of, of international solidarity um, and, uh, you know, none of us are free until all of us are free. That's what I got.